All right, everybody. Hello, uh, and welcome to Tolt Studio. I'm Kimberly Ogbayani, the Operations Manager for Tolt Yarn and Wool. Tolt Studio is an education space, a space where we can connect with you every month with special guests, teachers, designers, creators, and community voices to further the enrichment of your craft and yourself. This evening, we welcome Candace English, Tressa Widenar, and Jennifer Berg to share how their heritage and culture is integrated in the work they do in the fiber community. Each of our panelists will share a presentation and following all three speakers, we will have time for some Q&A. So uh, I'm going to bring Candace. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for Tolt for having us. Um, it's really an honor to be here, especially with Jennifer and Tressa. Um, it's you know just really exciting to have this opportunity to be here. Um, Jennifer and Tressa and I were talking about you know when I first got into the industry, I didn't really know any other natives who knit. Um, you know, knitting isn't a traditional thing, I guess, for my tribe um, and fiber arts in general. And so um, to have this community and this connection just really means a lot. And again, I'm really honored to be here. Um, just a couple of things before we start that we just want to let everybody know that questions are okay. Don't feel like you're going to be um, shamed in any sort of way if you have questions. Um, this is definitely a safe space. And I think that I can speak for Jennifer and Tressa that not just here, but anytime that um, it's really important for us that everybody knows that, that this is a, a safe space. Um, and then just to know that, you know, kind of what I'm gonna be talking about is, um, I'm just representing myself and my story and my journey. Um, I can't necessarily say that I'm representing all indigenous people, um, just myself. And so I'm just gonna kind of talk, um, Jennifer and Tressa have these amazing presentations, but I'm just gonna um, kind of chat about my journey and a little bit about um, how I bring spirituality and my connection with creator into making um, and how you can maybe do that as well. Um, I'm Blackfeet and Nez Pierce. I live in central Montana. I'm in Great Falls, Montana. Um, I grew up in between Browning, which is on the Blackfeet Reservation and Cutbank, which is a border town. Um, my mom is Blackfeet and Nez Pierce and my dad is white. Um, so growing up, it was really interesting. Um, anybody who is of mixed race can probably, um, you know, uh, I guess empathize with that um, because it definitely, um, sometimes you definitely feel pulled one way or the other. It's hard to fit in um, with one side and it's kind of hard to fit in on the other side as well. Um, my Blackfeet family are really amazing. They've always been very welcoming of me. Um, and a lot of them have white dads as well. But um, yeah, so I think that's kind of important and to what I'm talking about because um, there is definitely a loss of culture in there. Um, my grandparents were um, both taken and put into boarding schools. Um, I guess I don't want to necessarily get too into their story because that's kind of their story and their journey to tell um, but it definitely had a huge effect um, on our family and they had my mom has 14 brothers and sisters um, they lived in a house like literally the size of this room um, growing up so they grew up very very poor um, and with a lot of trauma with boarding schools there comes a lot of um, a lot of trauma. And so I will, um, when I'm done with the presentation, I'll just put in the chat some really good resources. If you don't know much about boarding schools, it's a really, I think, vital thing to learn about um, our history in this country. And especially if you're interested in um, indigenous perspectives, I think it's really important to do. Um, and Tressa and Jennifer might have some good resources too that we can also pass along to Kimberly and she can share. 
Um, so with kind of that loss of tradition in my family, um, there were some like really key things that I think that they were able to keep. My grandpa Emil was a um, really like avid hunter and gatherer. So we learned all of the traditional ways of hunting and gathering um, and especially traditional medicine. So plant medicine and my mom was um, brought up that way. And then when we ended up moving across the mountains over to Whitefish when I was in elementary school um, and we, she went to school and like learned the biology and all of the things about plants, you know, the more scientific things about plants. And so we always had that in, in how to gather in a traditional way. Um, you know, there's definitely certain things that you want to do um, while you're doing that. And so I think that that was such a core part of um, connecting with the creator when um, I was growing up through that. Um, and then as I got older, it was interesting growing up like in, you know, I grew up again, kind of all over Montana, but really on the West side where there's not a lot of indigenous people. I mean, I was maybe one of three or four indigenous people in my school. And uh, it wasn't always super welcoming. You know, I feel privileged because I am white passing. Um, but then as I got older, I definitely wanted to connect more with my, um, my roots. And then also, you know, those traditional ways that are so important that we're keeping alive and we're continuing. Um, where I live now in central Montana, we have a really large indigenous community, which is really awesome. And it's one of the reasons why I really love living here. So uh, I started, you know, I was a knitter. I've been a knitter for like 12 years. And then I really wanted to, uh, I wanted to be able to do, connect what my mom was doing with gathering plants with my knitting. Uh, so I started doing um, plant dyeing and I just kind of learned everything on my own. Again, Blackfeet are not like real traditional fiber artists. Um, and at that time, you know, this was probably 10 years ago. It was even harder back then to find the resources. Um, you know, I know that the Navajo have such a awesome, rich history with that. And so I've always really been um, envious a little bit of that because there's always, you know, just such a, such a connection between knitting and, you know, your indigenous ways, which is really cool. So I, um, I started just learning the things that my mom, you know, that I learned from her and used that in my dyeing. And then as I started to want to do farmer's daughter fibers, um, I knew that for me, dyeing naturally really was a way for me again to connect with creator. And so I didn't want to sell that. Um, I just wasn't really comfortable with doing that it was kind of something for myself and family and friends. So I started using acid dyes and I was doing it as a business. I knew that. Um, and then when I started, I realized as I was have going through this really like big life change, um, I was leaving my job and trying to start this crazy business. Everybody thought I was crazy for starting a yarn business. Um, that as I started dyeing yarn and really like praying a lot about what I was doing, this journey that I was on, I felt so insecure in so many different ways starting out in it. Um, that I, the more that I prayed on it, and as I started actually dyeing the yarn, I realized it was a way for me to really connect with the creator. And it was something larger than just dyeing yarn, you know, throwing colors in a pot. 
Um, so I really wanted to make sure to honor that and realize that for me, that that was, um, again, a way to connect with creator. So one thing that we always do before we, um, before we gather plants or have a gathering or are kind of making these connections is to smudge. Um, we black feet, we use um, sweet grass. And um, I know a lot of people use sage too. And I know that there's a lot of questions about that. You know, if I'm not indigenous, can I use those things? Can I practice those things? And I have thought about that a lot. And even as I started Farmer's Daughter Fibers, because I knew in my heart that this was a way to connect. I was, you know, making these colors and praying and thinking about my ancestors and my grandfather and different stories that I had learned, whether I should even share that with people, um, whether it would be appropriating my own um, culture, which I think that now that I know more is so um, telling of the shame that is brought on to indigenous people of their culture. And even still, um, that some of us and some, you know, younger kids too, don't still feel confident, um, to, to be able to share that. And so with sage and sweetgrass, I wasn't sure if, um, you know, I, whether or not should I, you know, we have sage in the store. Um, are people allowed to use that? Or what is right? What is not right? What is, you know, and Jennifer is going to talk about appropriating versus appreciation and all of those things. So I talked to a lot of elders about this um, and what I feel in my heart and what I, you know, talk to them about is that I think that it's, our ways and our culture and our traditions are to share and they've always been to share. Um, there's ways you can go about that. There's things that you can do to make sure that you're doing it the right way. Um, for sage and sweetgrass, you know, if you're purchasing it, purchasing it from an indigenous person who is gathering it in the correct way. One company I really love um, and they are in New Mexico is Bison Star. Um, and I can type that into the chat too um, once we get done so you can kind of have that. Um, but, but I think it is okay to use it as long as you're using it in the correct ways. It's not something that's like, ooh, woo, 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 you know, that type of thing. I see a lot of people doing that, but using it in a really respectful way. So once I started, um, you know, giving offerings and um, smudging before I was dying and using my practices, everything started really coming into um, fruition. All those manifestations that I had um, were really kind of coming into play with all of that. And within that too, I just kept listening to this like voice in my head of this is what I was supposed to be doing and that this was okay. And these are the things that I'm supposed to share. Um, and within that too, I think is so much of why Sisters United was born. Um, and those of you don't know, uh, three, about three years ago, we started Sisters United. So it's a nonprofit um, that at first it was just an initiative that we started um, to raise money for MMIW. And then it grew into completely its own thing. Um, and I can again, write in the chat, all of that. Um, information. So I think that if you are creating, um, if you're, whether you're a designer or a dyer or just a knitter, um, any type of maker, that you can find ways to really, you know, our art, fiber arts is such a um, meditative, spiritual thing, really. Um, you know, you're, when you're putting all of that effort, all of those things into every single stitch that you, um, you know, put in, you're putting in all of that energy and that energy is coming from somewhere. Um, you know, we really believe when, when I'm smudging and 
when I'm thinking about those things, I'm always thinking about four things. And these four things really, I think, are kind of across the board in um, not only in indigenous, but also in a lot of other, you know, religions or practices. Uh, you're thinking about your mind um, and your heart and your spirit and your body. So kind of remembering all of those things when you're smudging and you can can, um, you know, in, in whether or not you are, um, you know, with an organized religion or what, whatever those type of things you can, I feel like still bring this into your practice. And also I think another thing that really brings, um, more creativity into me. And again, that connection with creator, which are so interconnected for me is, um, being out in nature and enjoying nature and getting off of my phone and my screen and all of those things. And to be able to like, you know, I mean, it sounds so cheesy, but like listening to the birds and the trees and those things, I think all of those things again are so interconnected and can really bring in more to what you're doing um, creatively. So um, that's kind of, you know, the end of my little spiel and that I um, just, you know, again, I'm really honored to be here and thank you. Thank you for listening to me. And uh, I'm going to give it back to Kimberly so she can introduce Jennifer. I think we may be, uh, Jennifer, are you going next or Tressa, are you going next? Oh, sorry. It's okay. Tressa. No worries. <laughs> Thank you so much, Candice. Um, I'm going to invite Tressa. And here she is. Welcome, Tressa. Hello. Uh, let me get my screen up here. Um, hello, my name is Tressa. Um, I live in Gallup, New Mexico. Uh, and I... Um, this is my first time really doing a presentation like this. So forgive me if I'm uh, stumbling over some things. Um, it's, I'm out of practice. <laughs> um, I taught, I taught mid school math for nine years and um, yeah. And then I, I haven't been doing that for a while. So it's, it's kind of taking some, some effort to, to talk again. So um, I uh, am, I'm Navajo and um, my uh, dad is, um, from the kind of uh, north of Gallup here. Um, my mom is white and um, uh, yeah, just kind of listening to some of the things Candace talked about, um, there's definitely some uh, similarities between um, my experiences and Candace's, um, even though we uh, grew up on different parts of, and uh, different reservations and different areas. Um, and I, so I'm just gonna kind of share a little bit about, uh, and I mean, Candace mentioned, um, you know, the loss of culture. Uh, and that's something I think that has been a challenge for so many of us um, in our um, in our youth, um, because my dad was a boarding school uh, child and he um, was uh, lost a lot of a lot of his traditional uh, ways and, and we never grew up with those things. Um, so this is kind of a little bit about my journey to how um, I am trying to reclaim um, a part of my culture, um, and that is going to be specifically referring to um, uh, Navajo weaving. Um, so I, this is just kind of a way for me to, uh, I've, I've learned a lot about um, Navajo weaving and about um, the, um, specifically the sheep that, <laughs> um, that come from from the Navajo culture. So, um, okay, so I'll get started just because I don't wanna take forever on this and um, get going. So, okay, so my first slide, I don't know if it's gonna work, is it gonna work? Okay, uh, so this um, starting, I'm just gonna kind of talk about the history of um, how Navajo weaving came to be um, and this is just kind of going back to the beginning. So uh, the, the, the south, Southwestern uh, Native Americans have been in this area for thousands of years. Um, but in the 1600s, when um, Spanish colonizers came um, to this area, they brought sheep with them. 
Um, and the Navajo were known for kind of just adopting like all different parts of different cultures. Um, there was a lot of um, sharing of, um, of different kinds of things within, especially the Southwestern tribes. Um, and so the Navajo really took to the sheep um, and started to steal sheep from the Spanish colonizers and began to de develop their own flocks um, and quickly realized that sheep were kind of a, a really great way to kind of develop a pastoral lifestyle. Um, the sheep that they had were, um, were, were used for milk, uh, meat, and wool. Um, and the Navajo learned from the Pueblo tribes how to weave. Um, and the tradition is, is that Spider Woman um, started to teach the Navajo how to weave. And the um, blanket in this picture is an example of um, a first phase chief blanket, which is kind of the typical style that was used um, initially. So that's just kind of to give you some ideas. So, um, so the churro sheep, uh, this is a picture of a churro sheep, um, is, is a very hardy uh, sheep that came, uh, that became kind of central to the, to the life of the Navajo, um, specifically the wool. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so the wool of the Navajo churro is very long. Um, if you ever get your hands on um, some churro, it's pretty amazing. You can just kind of pull it apart and it's just got this long, um, kind of beautiful um, uh, length to it. Um, it. It doesn't have very many crimps. There's actually kind of some like hair kind of blended into it. Uh, and it has very low grease content. So like when you spin it and work with it, your hands don't really get all that dirty. So it was very common for Navajos to kind of shear the sheep and then just kind of spin it straight off the sheep, um, which in the Southwest was really important because water is, is very, um, you know, very important to, to save. Um, and then they also were able to develop um, beautiful rugs because their churro, the churro is a very strong, um, very long lasting yarn. Um, Oops, sorry. <laughs> so here's some examples of some um, Navajo rugs. Um, the rug on the left here, this is an example of um, a post long walk rug. Um, this, is, this is from um, probably somewhere in the 1880s. Um, there was a trader out in the Ganado area of, of Arizona who um, kind of developed a, a like catalog for Navajo weavers in which he would show a picture and then uh, send the, the weavers home and then they would make these, these rugs and then he would sell them and send them all over the country. Um, the rug in the middle here is an example of um, what is called a slave blanket. Um, the Spanish and the Navajo did not get along well um, throughout history and they um, would often kidnap women and livestock. And um, oftentimes they would take Navajo women because they were known for their weaving um, and then oftentimes um, would weave. And these were, this was actually woven on two, on two separate pieces, um, the middle of it having a seam through it because the, um, the, grand, the Rio Grande looms that the Spanish wove on were, were not as big as Navajo looms. So then these were um, pieced together. And then the rug on the right, um, is a rug uh, by a weaver known as Julia Jumbo, um, who is an incredibly fine, fine, fine weaver. This, I actually got to feel this rug. This rug is really like paper thin. Um, it's just a really beautiful design. Um, and these are from the Two Gray Hills area. So this, these rugs all come from the collection of Mark Winter, who um, is from the Totalina Trading Post. Uh, if you ever have an opportunity to visit there, um, it's just, it's a really cool place to, um, to visit because of all the, the collection of rugs that, that he still has there. Um, he will often talk about how rugs, the production of rugs has dropped drastically throughout um, the past like 50, 100 years. Um, and um, I'll talk a little bit about that now. Um, So now I'm going to kind of discuss about like what happened with um, the churro sheep. So in the, in 1864, the, um, the Navajo were, were like ousted. They were <laughs> rounded up and, and brought down to uh, Eastern New Mexico where they were left um, on this really tiny plot of land to try and um, 
I, it was just an internment camp um, where they were trying to essentially control the Navajo. They were really hard to control. Um, and uh, when they did when they did that, one of the problems they had with the Navajo is that they were really good at hiding. So when um, Kit Carson and um, a couple of other American um, soldiers were trying to round up the Navajo, they would go out to try to get them and they would just vanish. They would just disappear and um, just uh, had a really, I don't know, they were just able to kind of recognize when they were um, being threatened. And um, so what they did to resolve that was they started burning fields and killing livestock to try and starve out uh, the Navajo people. Um, and that um, killed off a lot of the, the Navajo Turo sheep, um, which ended up being pretty devastating um, to many people who um, had adopted the, the lifestyle of having sheep. Um, and eventually they were let go, they were sent home um, after I think five, four, four years. Um, and then they started to build up their flocks again and they started to have um, more livestock. And then there was a problem with overgrazing because you know people had, had too big of flocks. So in the 1930s and 40s, um, the government went through and started just killing livestock off just to reduce the flocks, um, which essentially brought the churro breed down to about 450 like sheep total, uh, which obviously was uh, very hard for a lot of Navajos because to them, sheep were family members um, and to just like be standing there watching, you know, the government just killing their animals was just really devastating. Um, so now there is an effort to revive the sheep breed. Um, these are some people who are working specifically with Navajo churro. Um, Nikhail Begay uh, has some beautiful, amazing pictures of his sheep if you want to follow him on Instagram. Uh, Jay Begay is another um, shepherd. These, these two people are both Navajo. Uh, Kelly Dunaj, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. <laughs> um, she is also, she is in California and she is non-native, um, but she is working really hard to try and keep the breed um, alive. Uh, Weaving and Beauty and Four Corners Yarn Collective are two places where you can actually buy Navajo churro yarn um, if you're interested in, in seeing it and, and feeling it. So um, so that leads to kind of my life. Um, I'm trying to watch the time here. Uh, I, Jennifer and I both grew up always being surrounded by sheep and weaving and like always grandmas, right? Like grandmothers who knew how to weave, grandmothers who, um, you know, just always had a, a loom up. Um, and I grew up uh, hearing my dad's stories about um, when he was when he was a boy and he had to herd all the sheep. Um, oftentimes they were pretty pretty hilarious because he would get into trouble all the time. <laughs> um, and uh, my great grandmother was a weaver. Um, I remember uh, she always had um, a, a some kind of pro project up. Um, we were able to kind of find some of her rugs um, because traditionally, you know, rugs never left, never stayed home. They would just, you know, finish them and take them in and sell them right away. It was a, a way of, of income. Um, and so that, you know, that was always just kind of in my memory. Um, and then my grandmother actually kept a small flock of sheep when we were kids. Um, and it was, we always enjoyed getting out to see them when we would go visit her. Um, so I never learned how to weave. Um, I didn't really have interest when I was younger. Um, but once I started to get into fiber arts, once I started to do knitting and designing, and, um, I really started to kind of feel a, a pull towards, uh, the traditional style of weaving. Um, and I, I was fortunate enough to, uh, have an opportunity to take classes here in Gallup, um, and actually got a job working for this um, weaving and beauty uh, shop where I've been able to just learn and learn and learn and learn um, all about the history of weaving and all about the wool and all about the quality of rugs. And um, it's just been a really amazing experience, um, you know, from, and like, and like Candace talked about natural dyes, you know, and that's something that is a really big part of some of um, Navajo weaving that you, um, you know, can have plant dyes and, um, I've learned some about that. And um, so these are some examples um, of the weavings that I've done. Um, as I think it's been probably three years now that I've been 
kind of working on um, the learning process. Um, so I won't talk a whole lot about that, but that's just kind of some some things that I have, some projects that I've done. I've been trying to learn different styles of weaving um, and just kind of uh, just just try to learn. I mean, it's 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 kind of a learning thing right now for for me, and um, it's just been a really beautiful way to connect again to that culture. I mean, it's each style comes from a different part of the reservation. And, you know, every time we work on one specific style, there's a really amazing connection to that part of the reservation that um, I've really uh, valued and really cherished um, throughout my, my experience. So, um, and then finally, my, um, my weaving designs or weaving has definitely influenced a lot of my knitwear design. Um, there's a lot of shapes that you can see um, in the in the designs that I've created that kind of come from uh, different uh, weaving styles and weaving, um, I guess, symbols that are put often into rugs. Um, and uh, yeah, you can just kind of see I have a headband called the rug weaver headband and um, this purse is called the wedge weave pouch because it's based off of a, a style of weaving that um, was popular in the late 1800s. And this hat that I have here is a, it has crosses on it, you know, because crosses are a big part of, of weaving, um, not just Navajo culture, but, you know, around the world. Um, and then the different colors and, and that sort of thing. So, um, and finally, in summary, um, despite the threats made on Navajo weaving, um, there's still an effort being kept or, uh, that many people are trying to keep alive. Um, I've met a lot of younger people um, that are are taking it up and learning and getting um, getting good at weaving again. Um, and it's been really cool to to see the efforts made to keep the churro alive, um, the breed, um, and just kind of how that has inspired me in my knitwear design. Um, and this is a picture of my of a a rug my great grandmother grandmother wove. Um, we actually found this shoved in my parents' garage, and my dad didn't realize it was in there, <laughs> and it was a mess. There was like you know spots on it, and it was just really dirty, like somebody had used it on the kitchen floor or something. Um, and I was able to take it into the shop um, where I've been working part time, and I I cleaned and scrubbed and got it. Um, feeling like wool again. It was real crunchy before that. Um, and now I'm, tr I'm hoping to do some repairs on it to try to re you know, re just kind of keep it, keep it in the family um, and just kind of um, just cherish those, those things that we have um, from my great grandmother. So I hope I didn't go too long. So, <laughs> um, and that's pretty much all I have um, at this point. And uh, thank you for your time. So I am done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tressa. Um, your your um, Instagram name, could you say it for us and your design name? Yeah, Simbi K. Simbi K is the name of my Instagram account. Um, that's so I probably should have talked more about that, but um, my my dad um, is a Navajo language teacher um, and he uh, likes to kind of um, come up with cute little things that you know, so that was one thing. So there's a lot of actual Navajo and Dutch, um, like kids in my community. Like when I was in high school, there was like a whole crew of us, you know, we were all like half Dutch, half Navajo. Um, and so they thought it'd be fun to try to come up with a clan, which is what happens in Navajo culture. Like if, you know, a family comes from the Mexican culture, which, you know, somewhere along my line there was, um, then your clan was the Mexican clan. So my, my clan is Nakai Dene'e, um, which is my dad's clan. And then my mom's clan is, is Dutch. <laughs> so then they came up with the, um, with the term Sinbike, um, which means wooden shoe. Um, and we, we've kind of been using that as our clans, um, in, in a way, which has been kind of a fun, a fun way to kind of identify with that. So, and I think Jen's got, you have one too, right, Jen? <laughs> She'll probably talk about that in a minute, but, um, yeah. So that's, that's where that comes from. <laughs> okay, great. I will bring Jennifer into the spotlight. Okay, let me share my screen. Hello, Jen. Hi, you guys. Um, I just wanna say, man, 
Candace and Tressa are like the coolest. Okay, <laughs> you guys are so cool. I know you're shaking your heads because you're so humble, but you guys are pretty dope people. Okay, so my presentation um, is a little different. Um, I'm kind of talking about more of a like, uh, I guess it's a controversial kind of subject, but then also a very um, important subject when you're considering, you know, there's three Native Americans on this panel. <laughs> so um, I'm covering cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation um, and just what does it mean and why it's important. Um, so I just um, kind of similar to what Candace had um, said earlier, I just kind of want to preface this, this is a really safe space um, for questions and to communicate and I'm not trying to like point fingers or make anyone um, like feel bad or shameful. I'm really just trying to bring awareness to this topic. Um, and I'm speaking about what I know as a Navajo woman in the design industry and um, I can't speak for other cultures. Um, so, you know, I can only answer the things that I, you know, have, have dealt with. Um, so let's just kind of jump into it. So a working definition for cultural appropriation. Um, so the unacknowledged or inappropriate adoption of the customs, practices, ideas, et cetera, of one people or society by members of another, like typically more dominant uh, people. So a larger group um, who's more dominant um, taking of, you know, customs and practices, um, inappropriately taking those. So, like the picture um, suggests. Um, so, what does this mean, really? And I, I wanted to kind of, like, dive into it because we're only given, I mean, I'm only going to speak for, you know, roughly 12 minutes, we'll see. Um, but um, I kind of want to just give examples. So, one um, would be urban outfitters. They were kind of controversial a few years ago for using the word um, Navajo. Um, and it wasn't so much just the word Navajo that they were using, it was in association with um, their products. So um, Navajo, the Navajo Nation has trademarked the word Navajo. So that was the whole issue. But on top of that, I kind of wanted to dive into, you know, what, was going on here. So um, they attached it to an item which was the Navajo panty, the Navajo flask, and the Navajo sock, and they had all these other different things. Um, so if you know Navajos, um, traditionally we're very modest um, people when we dress, and um, it just kind of felt a little contradictory to um, you know, our cultural value systems to just name something so flippant um, Navajo panty um, when, you know, not even knowing us and not having any consent to be able to name something that. And then um, the Navajo flask, I was a little irritated with this one, but um, na the Navajo Nation is a dry reservation, which means that they don't sell any alcohol on the entire reservation because, um, the alcohol abuse is so horrible on the reservations. And so it's just very, it's just a huge misrepresentation of Navajo people. Um, and some examples of things that um, are often appropriated are our artwork, um, our dress and fashion, and um, often, you know, some like, some practices and religious symbols, this one's less so, but um, these, are, these are examples of things that are real and these are not images of appropriated um, items, but these are. So, you know, the, I'm sure everyone has seen this around Halloween, the sexy native um, American Indian, um, the mascot and the dressing up of, you know, saying you're honoring a group of people when you dress up like this. Um, and then the last one is just kind of um, misrepresentation of whatever tribe these group of people are dressing up as. And this is um, at like a bike convention and there's like a teepee and just, it just, it's in a lot of ways, um, 
things have just been used kind of randomly at random times and um, just bring in a lot of like confusion and misrepresentation to whatever tribe that you know people are trying to attach themselves with. So um, I kind of want to dive into like why is this even a concept? Like why is this even something that needs to be talked about? And um, on a large scale, like on the most serious scale on a human level, um, appropriation can lead to dehumanization. And um, Native Americans are already fighting to exist in this world and be seen, you know, and as real people and that we matter as real people. And um, when you dress up, you know, in like a Halloween costume and, um, usually these Halloween costumes are attached to, you know, like really overly sexualized um, regalia, like mimicking regalia. And um, I just went on Amazon or I just went on Google and typed in Native American costume and then screenshotted the image that came up for sale, like the items that were for sale. And these are the top four currently for sale. Um, and I just was kind of like, okay, you know, like they're really, um, what tribe are they even trying to mimic? It was just a very stereotypical, you know, dress and then overly sexualized. And um, that over-sexualization can lead to Native Americans being dehumanized. And little do people know, but one in three Native women will be sexually assaulted or raped in her life. And just to, you know, make people realize like there's three Native American women on this panel and we're real people. And you know, that this type of thing can put us at harm because people do not view us as the same value or like they don't value us in the same way. Um, so that's one of the big concepts that um, appropriation can lead to. And then more on a like financial um, level, this is affecting, at least people from my tribe, I mean, every other reservation, every tribe, this affects um, when you're purchasing like knockoff jewelry and things like that, um, that money isn't um, going into the hands of the people that are making the authentic um, items. And so they're not being compensated and reservations already have it pretty rough. And so when the artists who are not being compensated for their hard work and getting it stolen, and then those people are profiting off of, you know, plastic, items that it, it just really um, affects those on the reservation. And because it was such a huge deal um, for so long, <laughs> in 1990, um, an act um, was enacted and it was called the Indian Arts and Craft Act. And this prohibits anyone from um, claiming um, that this is that their work is authentic when they are not uh, like an enrolled member of the tribe or um, they can't just like attach, you know, Navajo made on anything. It has to be from that tribe. And there has to be kind of proof that, you know, that it is authentic and real. Um, so I wanted to, this is um, the, some of the questions that I've been asked when I talk about appropriation. And um, the first question is, um, can only white people appropriate cultures? Um, no. This is, I'm just gonna debunk this right away because um, this is not only like a, you know, something like ganging up on white people subject. Like anyone can appropriate elements of marginalized cultures. I could appropriate Japanese culture. So um, another question I get is you speak English. Why aren't, or aren't you appropriating my European language? And, you know, we just, we got a little taste of, you know, assimilation um, from boarding schools from, you know, Candace family and Tressa's family and my own family. Assimilation is very different than appropriation. Um, Native Americans were forced to assimilate and forbidden to speak their native tongue. So this is, you know, this isn't one of those where um, it's appropriation. And um, so the last question is kind of a defeated, um, you know, feeling like shameful. So like 
so I can't enjoy any aspect of your culture. And that is absolutely not what I'm trying to say. And that's not what I want you to believe. I don't want you to like think like, oh, I appropriated something. I, you know, I should feel horrible and beat yourself up. And, you know, like I want there to be change and um, without having like talks like this, we can't really learn and grow together. And so I really wanna make sure that I'm sharing like the other side of it. And that's the appreciation side. Um, so, oh, right here. So how can you help or change from, you know, if you, you know, dressed up um, as a Native American for Halloween or something in the past, or, you know, something like that, like you can, change and you can bring awareness. Um, you can care about the issues that are surrounding cultural appropriation and research, be involved, be aware of what you're purchasing and um, you know, ask questions, show respect and give um, credit to the artists um, and amplify their work. So, and then um, you can, you know, appreciate the work and appreciate appreciation, cultural appreciation, means truly honoring our, na our nation's art and cultures, taking the time to learn and interact to gain understanding of a culture that is different from your own. So um, you guys are already doing that right now by interacting and learning and taking the time to invest and listen and learn. So, you know, thank you so much for supporting us. Um, it just, it does mean a lot to um, have our voices heard. Um, and other ways in which you can continue to support and show your appreciation for us and for our people is um, travel, you know, spend your money on the reservations and um, buy uh, artwork, take cooking classes. This is a different, this is a weird one. I would say, you know, take cooking classes or, you know, enjoy the cuisine, um, enjoy their, the music and, you know, buy from native owned businesses. Um, you don't only have to go to the reservations, obviously, to buy from native owned businesses because um, you can also support a bunch of native owned businesses like these. And this is a very short list of um, native owned businesses. And, um, I threw my, you know, my parents' store on there. <laughs> um, but the I can send this list if anyone would like it um, out. I can send it to Kimberly and she can forward it on. Um, and lastly, I want to talk about, um, you know, this isn't a subject that is just like black and white that, you know, in some instances, yes, it's right or wrong. And you should kind of have that feeling. But then there's some items and things that, you know, you still have questions about. And um, there are gray areas. And so, for example, and Tressa kind of talked about this, how cultures would share. And um, so Navajos make some Zuni designs and vice versa. Um, I believe that this is more of a cultural exchange rather than appropriation because they're, it's done mutually um, and they're continuing to honor that culture. And like Candace was saying, you know, this is something that culture will die unless we, like aspects of our culture will die unless we are sharing them with people. And so I think it is important to make sure that we're sharing. Um, and then again, if Lastly, if you're unsure, um, there's like the three S's that you can ask yourself if you have an item or something that you're like, well, I don't know if it's okay. Um, so the source like has the community that um, for the item like invited you to share in this. Um, and then like the significance behind it, like is it like an everyday? object that you are, you know, that you've been given consent to use and, um, or is it like a religious object and artifact? And that's when, you know, maybe just ask a question, um, is this cool if I, you know, partake because I'm, I really am wanting to learn and appreciate this. Um, and then the last one, similarity, um, is it like a knockoff, like a complete knockoff, or is it like more of a nod to a color scheme? Because some people ask me like, can I wear this? And it's like a turquoise ring and it's just kind of just random turquoise. And I'm like, that's fine. It's not like Navajos don't have, you know, 
yes, they have um, a connection with turquoise, but they don't get the rights to like <laughs> say every turquoise, everything is Navajo. Um, it's just, you know, that's a nod to a color scheme. So um, yeah, yeah. So I just wanna say thank you um, everyone for giving, again, the three of us um, your time and um, to Tolt for, you know, the, the platform to be able to speak and educate and uh, allow you guys to get to know us a little more and a little more of our background and who we are and knitwear designers and business owners and how we're involved in the fiber arts. And um, yeah, so if any of you have questions, let me, stop sharing. Um, this is kind of going to open us up to uh, Q&A. Uh, all right, so I'm going to have um, all three of our wonderful speakers on the screen with us. And um, please feel free to um, put your questions in the chat and I will facilitate um, making sure that they get to Candice and Tressa and Jen. There are a lot of thanks coming on here <laughs> and a lot of appreciation and gratitude. Um, it's wonderful to see. Um, while people type, I can ask you, what's on your needles right now? All three of you are knitters. What's... Um, what, what are we knitting? Um. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> you're knitting the outline, I think. Yeah, that's what it's called. <laughs> yeah. That's knows. funny because I it took me so long to like. This is my second one, and I'm finally remembering the name. Yeah. Um, obviously, I like the pattern. I just, you know, <laughs> I can't remember it either. I don't know why. Outline is not a word I like use or something. <laughs> what do you think, Tressa? I don't have a whole lot on my needles right now. Um, I've wrapped up a lot of projects, um, lots of patterns and uh, finishing deadlines and stuff. So I've actually kind of, am in a, I'm in a lull right now. Um, so I don't have um, anything I can think of. Um, you, are you knitting some socks? I saw you had some wool for your socks. I do, but I have not started knitting those yet. <laughs> they're just sitting there like doing nothing so that's like my next project is to get some of your socks knit up <laughs> I need some socks. so there's a question is the navajo nation open to visitors yet um i believe so my parents store has been open for uh four weeks now i think um certain parts of it like page arizona are still um pretty closed off and some of the Pueblos, you're, you're not allowed to go into the Pueblos still. They're all, the roads are blocked off, but the Navajo Reservation seems to be open, but. Um, I think there I think there are pockets of, of places you are still kind of, uh, like, I don't know if Canyon Duche is open yet. Um, we went to Window Rock a few, day, few weeks ago and we went to the zoo and stuff and you have to like, they're, they're like limiting um, people that can come in and, and whatnot, so. Yeah, it kind of depends on where you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, here's uh, one from Jessica. How do you approach tokenism in this community and uh, how and what can we do to be better about authenticity versus token representation? That's a hard one. <laughs> um, you know, Oh man, I run into it a lot, to be honest, um, especially after maybe certain people have gotten in, um, have just made poor decisions. And then in order to like, you know, try to um, redeem themselves, then they'll ask to work with us. And that doesn't always feel great. Um, but I think just being authentic, which is hard to like, how do you know if somebody's being authentic? Creating those relationships, I think is important before anything else. Um, and I feel like we're all pretty judge, good judge of characters to know what, you know, what's what. I don't know. I don't, I mean, you guys might have a better answer for that. Um, it's a hard one. Well, I, I think that like part of it too is just including, you know, people that are all different and not like 
trying to just, you know, be fill out a box. Yeah. Yeah. Like and, a box and, off. Yeah, exactly. Um, and making it more normal for like, you know, for everybody to be included. Um, you know, and 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 I know that the three of us have tried to be representative of the native community in the fiber world. Um, in a in a sense, it's kind of a stepping stone. Like we'd like we want to represent the native community, but we also want to make it more normal, you know, to make it be like, yeah, this is just the way we do things instead of just, you know, oh, cool, we've got these native people that, you know, can be our like representative here. Um, and I think that that's probably more about what um, I feel, you know, is, is kind of the, the whole point of what we're trying to do is like, show everybody that you know we're just as capable you know there's just we're just like everybody else and you know we want to be included and we want to be a part of this community and um we we need to make that more normalized so yeah, yeah. definitely um, I think we also have like a conversation about how like um tress and i are navajo you know and like we don't speak for other tribes, you know? So I think it's important to, for even us to acknowledge that, like, we're not speaking for every indigenous group. We, we are speaking for one, you know? And um, I think that, you know, is the authenticity in what we're doing too. Yeah. To make it, make sure that people know we even exist. And then on top of that, that we're only one group and there's a lot of groups. <laughs> Um, there's again, more appreciation, extremely informative and presented beautifully, just more compliments for you. Um, and then Liz asks, it was great to hear about the sheep Tressa has a connection with, are there fiber types or fiber animals that Jennifer or Candace have particular connections to? My dad's family were sheep ranchers. Um, by the time I came along, they the sheep market had gone down in the in the sixties and seventies, and so um, they had replaced them with cattle. Um, but I thought it was funny, Tressa, that you said you had all these stories about your dad, like taking care of the sheep, and my dad had the same thing, like mm -hmm. getting lost in the mountains with sheep. Um, but I don't think I have any particular, you know. I mean, I love sheep. Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> I think I guess I just want to put out there that you've worked hard on having special yarns at the farmers that are fibers I mean that are really special <laughs> just put that out there <laughs> thanks <laughs> uh, I, I love that Candace like your you know your Wyoming Montana blends are like I like to work with them because they're special to you you know yeah. and the, the effort you've put into developing that yarn um I feel like that that's been a pretty significant thing of, of working with you is that, you know, you have a yarn that like is special for you, um, which I think is really amazing. So. Thank you. And right now that's Sukapi, Pishkin and Recollect, right? Those all three of those. Yep. Yeah. 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 Pretty amazing. And you guys just got a, a decent order in, didn't you? Really? Mm -hmm. We sure did. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> already planning the next one it's actually really fun to like look at the colors and just dream and just yeah love it um there's never another sort of like big question could you give some um extra perspective on appropriation when creating indigenous inspired designs and how it's and they're putting they're saying that and it's not okay to monetize these um, so I've got a few questions from people, you know, asking like, hey, like I really appreciate um, Navajo rugs or something and, um, you know, like I really want to copy that design and make a cowl or something. And my answer is, you know, like, I think that's fine if you want to do that for your own, for your own, like, for something you want to wear or something, but um, it would be really awesome if you let like indigenous people make those designs to sell because, you know, that's similar to, uh, you know, a silversmith making jewelry and then you saying, well, I can make that and then making it yourself instead of, you know, buying the, the ring that's right there. Um, but I, I really 
don't think that it's um it's kind of one of those areas where it would I think it's fine if you would do it for yourself but I don't really think that it should be something that you're out there selling because you could get in trouble with Indian Arts and Crafts Act and stuff like that so um I wouldn't really I don't know if I would chance it just because of stuff like that I mean I'm not coming after you but you know I don't know who might you know have an opinion on it yeah and uh, I think go ahead, go ahead Ken. Who's... sorry Ken. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think also the, um, you know, Jen and I have talked about this ourselves, you know, like how do we make sure we're not like taking from our own culture in a way that's disrespectful in a way that's, um, you know, take, we try to st avoid things that could be considered sacred symbols and, um, and, and like, you know, it, it is, it's just, it's a matter of, um, of trying to be respectful of where it's coming from because I mean so much of what has happened throughout history is just that you know native people have just been um appropriated you know with you know team names with like um you know with art essentially and just kind of this um you know well we're going to take your lands we're going to take your you know we're going to just going to use your art how we want to and I think there's a need to kind of restore that back to the indigenous cultures that um, those, those things came from. Um, and I think that's part of, you know, like respecting the art that comes from native tribes, instead of trying to take advantage of those things, it's important to let, um, you know, especially like with, with our culture, you know, the, the silversmith and the weaving, um, there are people that, uh, take weaving classes and, and, um, that are non-native and, um, they're, you know, here in Gallup, um, and the, the people that teach the classes, you know, they're, they say this is an appreci appreciation thing for you. You know, this is not a way for you to, to make money. This is a way for you to learn and appreciate the work that goes into this, but it's not yours to go and, and just, you know, use on your own. So, yeah. I really like, um, oh, actually that's funny. Verna just wrote that. I just saw that, but I was going to say eighth generation, which is a native company in Seattle. Um, they're really great. And they say um, inspired natives, not native inspired, um, which I think is a good thing to just kind of like think in your head, like, is this inspired by native American art or is there an inspired native American who's making this art? Um, it's a good kind of question to ask yourself and two it's sometimes it's hard because you know just like you're talking about tokenism that intention is really a big part of it and sometimes people can have good intentions and they still make a bad decision um and then sometimes people have intentions and they don't even think that this could symbol could be a indigenous symbol um, that this, you know, and, and so then I think that kind of sometimes falls in that gray area too of, you know, indigenous people, the, and, and knitting's a great example. We kind of talked about this of, you know, fiber arts are traditional to a lot of indigenous cultures, but they're also, um, you know, from a lot of other places around the world that, you know, their, their early traditions as well. And so that, that, you know, the world is a small place and that we are kind of all this, you know, melting pot. Um, and one thing too, and I think that, you know, I think that, uh, Tressa and Jennifer would agree with me too, is, Shaming is a colonial tactic. Um, it was used, shaming is huge on, um, on using it against us to not follow our culture. Um, you know, especially in the early 30s, 40s, 50s, shame was huge. The um, Catholic church used it. You know, a lot of people use shaming. And so now when we're sitting here and especially sometimes on social media and people are getting so shamed out into, you know, mistakes that they have made that it can be really triggering for the people that you're trying to protect. Um, and I know personally, I have a really hard time with it, especially when it is a 
white person who is shaming another white person for doing something, you know, appropriating or whatever it is. I just feel like sometimes there's a, a different way to go about it. Um, and I also understand the argument that, you know, without some of that shame that people wouldn't make those changes too. Um, so I do think that's, you know, just something to think about when you're talking about appropriation, you're talking about, you know, having these conversations. So, yeah. Yeah. I agree, Candice, with the shame. Like, I think that like with, you know, like I, I, I feel like I have to preface like this kind of type of conversation with, I am not trying to offend you. I'm not trying to defend myself. I'm just trying to have a conversation and I want it to be really open. And this is how, you know, this is how my people talk to each other where, you know, we can just kind of throw it out there. So like, I don't want you to feel ashamed. And if you do, and you feel like you've done something wrong that, you know, there, there's grace. There might be that. some things there that you need to work yeah. through. Right? That. That. And you can move forward and we can yeah. grow and learn and you can change yeah. without having to carry around the shame and without having to carry around that, like, you know, that burden of like, oh, everyone's going to come after me if I mess up or something like that's like the worst thing ever. And I, I, yeah, I definitely do not like that kind of, you know, struggle within, I mean, the knitting community and everything too. Yeah. And I, I also feel like it, it can be a bit of a, a hurdle for, for the people that are trying to make it more diverse in this community. Um, you know, I think that there's this fear of, of having made maybe mis misstep somehow. Um, and then the fear of like being completely canceled out and like, I, I don't see how that's beneficial for, you know, people of color who are trying to be more a part of this. There's always this fear of it being attacked, you know, and like, um, I live with that like all the time. <laughs> like I'm always afraid to go on my Instagram. I'm like, I hope I didn't say something <laughs> offensive, you know, and um, Tressa, like messages me like every week, like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. <laughs> Tress, you're so fine. You. Yeah. And I think that's so like, again, it's because we are ingrained that shame is ingrained in us. It is a part of our trauma and that, you know, again, people might think that they have good intentions by calling somebody out, but I think that for indigenous people, it, it, it's rough. Sometimes it's hard to, you know, see that and deal with it when, um, when you're trying to heal and you're trying to get, you know, past that trauma and trying to make those changes. So. Yeah. And it, it's, I mean, it's the generational trauma that, you know, that we all live with that, um, you know, most people aren't aware of that. I mean, there's so much in our history that like has caused us to feel those emotions, you know, when things are like in your face, when like, you know, there's this like aggressiveness. I mean, there's this kind of you know, kind of wanting to hide in your turtle shell, you know, of like, I just don't want to put up with this because I'm afraid that like, you know, this, I don't know. It, and I think that's a big part of why, um, you know, there are so many Native Americans that are, are struggling with finding leadership roles, with finding uh, their footing, um, with finding the ability to, to stand strong in their cultures, because there's this constant fear of, of the, the shaming and the guilt and, um, and whatnot. So, yeah. I think it's interesting that even within ourselves, like we have a hard enough time putting ourselves out there as Native American women, like, and then on top of that, like trying to like, I feel like because we're all half, we're always trying to prove that we're Native. And then I'm just like, that's pretty messed up that we're always trying to like, like, force people to believe that we are who we are and that that's just a like a really big struggle for the three of us and I think that's why we like it's really cool tonight that we all connect on that level um and I mean I think that's why we're able to be a little you know more vulnerable about this kind of stuff <laughs> there's a lot of deep appreciation over in the chat <laughs> just you know saying thank you for having the courage to make yourselves this vulnerable and it's a it's really such a gift. Um, uh, and 
So others said that you're bring, making my heart so full. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Jessica says, we can all do a better job at the words we use on behalf of other folks, as well meaning as they might feel that shame Candace talks about is huge when it comes to moving the conversation forward. Mm. Yeah. Um, there is one thing I, I, I don't, um, it's such a big topic. I hate to move forward onto the next thing. Um, there was just a request to hear about Sisters United and um, that's something that I really love. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great segue into it because, um, you know, we talk about indigenous, we talk about these things of, you know, um, generational trauma. I mean, the trauma is so there and it's so huge. And with Sisters United, we really are focusing on the empowerment. Let's talk about women, indigenous women who are doing awesome, amazing things. There's so many of us out there that while it's important to bring up these statistics and it's important to be aware, that's the first part of it, but also it's really important that we are empowering each other. Um, so I started Sisters United in 2000, January, 2018, like I said, I just, um, there were a couple of girls who have gone missing in Montana. Um, Ashley Heavy Runner um, was one of them and she was on the Blackfeet Reservation. Um, she was, she went missing the same time that a, a hiker did. And this hiker was a, you know, white girl who was traveling through Montana got lost in the mountains and they had everybody out there looking for her. She was found. She was just taking a hike with her dog. Um, you know, within like 24 hours, she was find, found. And actually really nothing ever came of it. They, the search, nothing. And this was, I mean, even three or four years ago, like MMIW, this was kind of before the big movement was being vocalized. And it just set, I couldn't get rid of that feeling of like, nobody's doing anything. Why isn't anybody doing any, anything? And honestly, I'll say in the last four years on the Blackfeet Reservation, not a lot has changed. Um, we had two, a three-year-old and then a young man went missing um, just this last month. And um, not a lot is being pushed forward through it. Um, and so I started just the initiative. I, my mom donated teas and I donated yarn and we sold out of those two things in like, you know, five minutes. I was like, Oh, I can just keep doing this every month. Um, you know, this is a great way for me to give back. Um, and then within that, I, I really wanted to be educated about human trafficking and MMIW and all of those things. I'm also on my own journey again of healing and um, really figuring out, you know, um, just a lot, you know, it, it, there's a lot to dissect there. And so within that I was, you know, doing both, but then we were getting, you know, people wanted to donate money, large sums of money. I was realizing that, you know, when I was earning the money at first or getting the money donated, we were donating it to other organizations, but there was nobody out there doing what I wanted to do, which was empower women. You know, I really wanted that empowerment piece. I didn't just want to give money away. So we ended up creating a 501c3. Um, and then 2020 happened, which was, you know, weird year, obviously. Um, and we did what we could. We donated to a lot of um, places, especially, you know, the, the Blackfeet Reservation is definitely, um, it has a long way to go. And I really, I was in New Mexico a couple years ago and was just like, so in awe of these young people down there who are like doing it and making it and making a difference and you know really really engaged in their communities it was so inspiring for me and so that's really what i wanted to bring um and then this year we were able to hire our first um employee hannah pate she is amazing she's a young blackfeet woman who is like 
you know, when you're young and 20 years old and like nothing's going to stop you, she's the perfect person for the job. So we're doing a lot of different things right now. Um, we have a sovereign art scholarship, which is, um, you know, we're donating art supplies to students who apply to that. Um, it's open right now. Right now, it's only open to kiddos in Montana, but that might change um, in the next week or so. So um, you can follow us at Sisters United MT and then um, also check out our website as well. So it's really fun and exciting. We're just a tiny little baby org and we're figuring it out, um, but the programming is gonna be pretty awesome. And it's just, you know, it's really great to be able to um, connect with other indigenous people in, in um, you know, making change. So mm. hopefully that summed it up. Yeah. I, um, we're, I'm going to come on and I'm going to join you for just a couple minutes just to say an enormous thank you for joining us tonight. It, um, it was just an honor to host the three of you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. And this will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, it should be up there by tomorrow. And so some of those resources will be there, but I'll also work on making sure that the resources that were shared are in the description as well, so that it's a little easier to access. Um, and we'll work on that for by tomorrow. So thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you for joining us. Bye, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica right there. <laughs> yeah.